Welcome to Milan Recording Studios. My name is James Pavel Shakras, and this instrument sitting in front of me here is something that is absolutely fascinating, and I am so happy to be able to present it to you in today's video. This is the fourth video of the Time Capsule series I've done so far. I've already reviewed, let's see, I reviewed a Casio synthesizer, a Moog synthesizer, and a uh, old Italian chord organ, and this here is the fourth instrument in that list. This is a Simone Celesta, made in somewhere in the 1940s in the United States of America. So what makes this instrument unique? Well, I've already said two of the things about it. It's from the 1940s, and it's a Celesta. So first of all, what is a Celesta? And I'll show you the inside of it here, and you'll get to see how it works, but just on a verbal basis, a Celesta is an instrument kind of similar to a piano, but it's kind of more of a cross between a piano and, say, a vibraphone. It does use hammers, like a piano does, but instead of striking strings, it strikes little metal bars, which creates a tone that is very similar to a glockenspiel. There's a very close relative of the Celesta known as the key glockenspiel, and the main difference between the key glockenspiel and the Celesta is that the Celesta is typically bigger, and the key glockenspiel uses much harder hammers, usually wood, sometimes even metal or plastic, whereas the Celesta Modern day ones use piano hammers, and this one used a very simple wooden hammer, which we'll take a look at in a little bit. So it's a Celesta. These instruments are very, very rare. You don't see them for sale very often, and usually when you do, they're usually in pretty bad shape. But what makes this one special is that it's from 1940 and is pretty much all original. There's one replaced hammer that we didn't replace, someone else before us did. Um, they recovered it with new red felt, so it's nice and clean. Uh, and other than that, it's pretty much all original, and it's in near-perfect working condition. The only things that we needed to fix when it was delivered to us uh, was that some of the dampers weren't quite lifting up high enough, so they weren't. Um, they were still dampening the tines, uh, and some of the keys needed easing. And in fact, one of them up here still does. It's a very easy fix, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but why is this instrument from 1949? Um, that's the rough date that we have put it to. Uh, why is this instrument from 1949 in such good condition? All original, perfectly working, in beautiful cosmetic shape. I mean, of course, it does have some minor nicks and scratches, but nothing major. Why is it in such good shape? Well, the story behind this instrument, and we got it from a broker, and his story, he, what he told us, was that a orchestra had this instrument. And the Celesta's role in an orchestra, in a symphonic setting, is very, very limited. There are not very many pieces written for the Celesta. The Celesta is a very quiet instrument, so you can't really just put it into anything and have it work. It's not going to replace a piano or replace a harpsichord. It's got a different sound, and it's not as loud as even a harpsichord. It's a very quiet instrument. So you're not going to be able to use it in place of another instrument. It has its own special niche role, and as a result, the Celesta doesn't get used very often. So the symphony, um, the orchestra basically decided, we don't need this Celesta anymore, we're going to sell it, and we take that money and put it towards something more usable. So this Celesta had basically sat somewhere in a pretty nice environment for most of its life, in some orchestra pit, hidden in some closet, probably covered with some kind of a blanket, and most likely was just probably moved around from one place to the other just because it was in the way. Uh, that's just all hypothetical stuff, but it's what I'm assuming. The Celesta isn't used very much. Uh, like I've already said, there's only a few very famous pieces that many people recognize. And of course, there's other works too, but most of the mainstream stuff is only going to be played once or twice a year, and then the Celesta sits in a corner. So that's why a lot of Celestas these days are very expensive, because there's not a huge demand for them. And on top of that, they are very limited use instruments. So what the heck am I going to use with it in the studio? Well, for starters, I mostly got it just because I wanted a Celesta. They're so, so cool. And I'll show you the interior workings of this thing in a bit. And once you see that, and once you hear how it sounds, I think you'll think the same way too. But on top of that, it has such a unique sound, like I've already mentioned, it would fit beautifully with all kinds of other things. It does have a sound very similar to a glockenspiel or a vibraphone without the, uh, the tremolo. So one might argue, why not just use a vibraphone or use a glockenspiel? Well, because of the keys, you can play much more complicated passages on a celesta or a key glockenspiel than you could on a traditional glockenspiel or vibraphone played with a pair or a um, set of mallets. Uh, you can do a lot more things with this instrument, and I'm going to be able to play this instrument better than I would a vibraphone or a glockenspiel. So... That is part of the reason why I bought this Celesta, also just because it's super, super cool, and it's not every day you get to see an instrument that is 
I wouldn't say it's in like new condition because the wood is aged and it doesn't look brand new, but functionally it is in brand new condition or like new condition from the 1940s. And that doesn't happen every day. Um, in case you're curious, this here is a little lid for it. Uh, basically, it can just fold down and cover the, uh, the keys when it's not in use. There's this little lid prop here. Uh, which over the years has become a little bit janky. Um, I'm assuming it was a little bit more structurally sound back in the day, but what it does is you just kind of set it there and it will hold the lid. You don't want to put like something heavy here, like even an iPad will make it kind of fall backwards, but gentle music will uh, sit up here very nicely and will hold the instrument. One of these days I'll get around to modifying this to a small extent to make it a little more beefy, but for now it will do. Now that issue I mentioned here earlier with the key, sticking down, I said it needed easing. What is that? Well, I'm getting a little technical here, and hopefully you don't mind this, but the keys in this instrument are very similar to those found in a piano. They're almost the same. So in the around the center of the key, you have a center pin, and the key balances on that center pin by means of a bushing. So they, basically there's a hole in the key that goes over that center pin, and if that bushing is a little bit too tight around that center pin, you'll have this. The note is completely functional, as you can hear. It's just the key doesn't want to come all the way back up. And if you play this note, you'll feel that there's a bit of extra tension uh, and friction, especially at the bottom of the key bed. And that's simply because that bushing is a little bit too tight. There's a special tool made in Japan called a key easer or a bushing easer that you use to gently open up that bushing just a tiny bit and make it a little bit less tight. And that would fix that problem. So it's a very, very easy thing. Although taking apart the Celesta is a bit of a process. Um, so that's why I haven't bothered to do that just yet. But it's a very easy thing, and it's a, this happens in pianos a lot as well. Uh, so if you have a piano with a sticky key that works but doesn't like to come up, it's probably, most likely, an issue with the bushing, and it's pretty easy to fix. Now, although I said that taking apart the instrument is difficult, I am mostly was referring to this top part to allow the keys to come out. That's a bit of a process. you got to take this lid off and all that stuff. But removing these front panels and the back panels is as simple as removing two and sometimes even one screw, then the panel pops off. So let's show you what's on the inside. It's hecka cool. This is the inside of the Simone Celesta, and it's ac accessed from the front of the instrument by removing two small screws that are found in the bottom right and left hand corners of the instrument. Once you remove those, the front panel simply falls away, and you are allowed to look inside the instrument. Um, and this is what it looks like, and it's quite an interesting mess, isn't it? It's very, very interesting. So. Basically, the way this works is it's a percussion instrument. You have little hammers, which you can see here, that are propelled downwards by the motion of the key, and they will then strike a bar. And you can see a couple of these bars up here where they're not hidden by the damper mechanism. You can also see the bars here as well, but you can see a full bar over here. So when you push the key, it basically um, swings the hammer downwards. It hits that key and then bounces away to allow the key to resonate. In the areas of the instrument where there are dampers, when you push a key, um, it will also raise the damper up off of the instrument too. So that as long as you're pressing that note, the tine is able to ring, and then when you let go of the note, the bar is muted. The damper pedal, which is here, um, allows you to raise all of the dampers up all at once. It works by the pedal lowering this center bar here, which pulls downwards on these levers here, which then tilt the entire damper mechanism up and away from the bar in this same motion, except not as exaggerated. The way that the notes are arranged in the instrument is very interesting, and I'm not exactly sure why they've done it this way, but this seems to be pretty standard with many Celestas. In this instrument, they are arranged in minor thirds, so each bar in each tier is a minor third apart, and you can see this because the middle bar is a D diminished seventh chord, the uh, bar, the tier below here is a D flat, and then the one up here, which you cannot see, When I play the diminished chord correctly, no other keys in any of the other tiers are working, so that means everything up here is a C diminished seventh chord. So I find that very interesting that each tier is a minor third apart, each bar in each tier is a minor third apart, and that means when you actually play the instrument normally and you don't just play a, a diminished chord, uh, you will end up seeing hammers all across the instrument playing all at once. which is a very interesting look, very chaotic, and very, very cool. So that's what the inside of this all-original 1940s Simo and Celesta looks like. We can also take a look at the back of the instrument, too. 
This is the back of the Simone Celesta, which again is accessed by removing the back panel, which like the front panel is held on by only one screw this time. It's located at the top. You remove that and then the back panel can fall away and allow you access to the rear of the instrument, which looks even more complicated than the front of the instrument. We can now see all of the wires that connect the hammers to their respective keys, and you can now see all three tiers of bars. You have the top tier up here, which is connected to their respective keys by a very short wire. You have the middle tier of bars, which is connected to their respective keys by a medium length wire. And then you have the lowest tier, which is connected to their respective keys by a very, very long wire. So you can see here that it's very, very complicated, but yet also very logically laid out at the same time. And like before, you can see that everything here is all original. Um, you can see the old patinaed wood with the really cool Simone badge. I just think that looks super cool. You can see that the keys have not been cleaned. None of the wood in here has been replaced or cleaned. It is all original and all perfectly functioning from the 1940s. There is a uh, little, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like an embossing, like a stamp uh, for a date stamp up here on the keys. It's actually split between two keys, so it's difficult to read what exact year it's from, but I'll post a picture of it up here. The folks on the Patreon page will recognize that because I posted that up there a long time ago, and now I'm making this video here. So you guys got a very early sneak peek of the Celesta. But it definitely says 1940 something. The current guess from the patrons and from myself as well is 1949. So this Celesta is quite old. That's the date stamp up here. And these keys, as you can see, um, like I mentioned, are all original. Each one has a lead weight, or at least it appears that most of them have a lead weight in the back to create a even heavier action. And then when you push down the key, the back end of it lifts up which then lifts up the hammer, causing it to strike the tine. And when the hammer swivels downwards, it also propels the damper to go up into motion. There's a little twisted bar here, a little twisted piece of wire uh, that pushes up on the damper like so. You can see just how simple the construction of the dampers is, at least I hope you can. They're basically just a block of wood mounted on the end of a stick with a little felt pad underneath of them. But they are in fact quite effective and they do a very good job of muting the tines. And you can just see all of the chaotic wires and cables and springs uh, that are back here to allow the action to work. It's very, very interesting, and it's super cool that it's all original from 1949. I thought it would be really cool to play a little random bit of music on the Celesta with the panels off so that you can see the action in motion. You can even see me behind here because I've got both the front and the back panels off and you can see right through the Celesta. So let's play a little random bit of music here on the instrument and you can watch the action do all of its really cool things and it just looks super, super cool. <laughs> so neat. You've already heard a little bit of what the Celesta sounds like with me poking this key up here and playing the instrument a bit with the cover off. But let's uh, take a step back and talk about some of the music that is most famous for the Celesta. Arguably the most famous piece ever written for the Celesta was by Tchaikovsky in his Nutcracker Suite, specifically Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. The story behind this is very interesting because Tchaikovsky first discovered the Celesta when it was first being invented in Paris, and he discovered the earliest Celestas, and basically, long story short, he said, I want to be the first composer to use this instrument. And so he wrote Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, which really played into the Celesta's beautiful, magical, pure sound. And that was one of the first pieces ever written for the Celesta, and it wowed audiences at the time because they had never heard such an instrument. It literally didn't exist. It was a brand and new concept. Um, so that, of course, is one of the most famous pieces written for the Celesta, and I'll play a tiny excerpt of that here. Um, I might, perhaps, later on in the year, uh, actually learn the full Celesta part and then relearn the uh, piano accompaniment part and play those two together. That might be kind of cool. That will be featured on my second channel, Milan Recording Studios, when I get around to doing, doing that. But, of course, you'll recognize this as soon as you hear it. <laughs> It's
It's iconic. It's become kind of a Christmas classic at this point, and it's a really, really lovely piece. Another piece of music that has that I associate with the Celesta um, would be the theme from Pirates of the Caribbean for Davy Jones. Uh, it's more of a music box type of uh, piece, and I believe they used a music box of some sort for the original uh, soundtrack, but the Celesta has a very music box-like sound, so of course it fits right at home. <laughs> I'm not going to play the full thing, but you've certainly heard that, most likely, and if you haven't, I hope you enjoyed it. Another piece that was not written for the Celesta, and has nothing to do with the Celesta, but still sounds really good on the Celesta, is this one. And some of you may recognize this too. Again, I'm not going to play the full piece of that, but isn't that beautiful? It's so, so lovely. As you can hear, the Celesta has a really, really gorgeous sound. I don't really think I need to talk too much about the sound of it, because you can, of course, hear it. It's very bell-like, it's very pure, and it's just absolutely beautiful. Uh, you have the, the lower notes down here that have the kind of the deeper, more resonant sound. And then the high notes up here are very bright and percussive. which is always nice to hear. Now, of course, although you can totally play music written for the Celesta on the Celesta, you don't have to. You can play other stuff too. So let's experiment a little bit and see what other type of music sounds good on the Celesta. Um, let's start off with playing some Scarlatti Sonatas. I won't play the full, um, I won't play both in their entirety, but I'll play uh, Sonata K1, and then I'll play a little excerpt of K380 in E major, uh, and we'll see how both of those sound. It'll be interesting for sure. That's super neat. Uh, and then we can also play a little excerpt of K380. I'll play my favorite section of the piece, which I think sounds best on the Celesta. So you can play a lot of different types of music on the Celesta. Here is a Sibelius Etude. Again, not the full thing. I actually run out of keys for this one, which is why I can't play the whole thing. Uh, the Celesta always has a pretty limited range. This particular one is four octaves. Today, you can find five octaves Celestas, which add an extra octave down to the low bass. But this one here is the pretty standard uh, range of four octaves. Mm -hmm. 
You're probably wondering if you ever, if you play piano, you're probably wondering what the action of this instrument feels like. Since you've seen it now, you're probably really interested to know what it feels like. And it's a very unusual feeling. Um, I can't really equate it to really much else. Um, it doesn't really feel like a piano. It's kind of more heavy, substantial, and less responsive than that of a piano. A modern celesta would be a different story. Modern celestas by Schiedmeier have a very light, quick, responsive action, but since this one was from the 1940s and it was pretty primitive, as you could see, the action isn't as refined as the modern-day celesta. Um, but nonetheless, as you can see, you definitely can play it and get some intricate music out of it, but it definitely does feel heavy and it is a bit of a workout compared to perhaps a normal piano, a digital piano, or even something like... Uh, I don't know, Fender Rhodes. That's kind of what the action almost reminds me of. It's like a stock Fender Rhodes. It has that same, like, it has that same kind of squidgy feeling, which is very interesting. But despite the fact that the action isn't perfect and prim and proper, the instrument still is a delight to play, and I absolutely enjoy playing it. It's so much fun, the sound is so cheery, and it's just absolutely lovely. <laughs> So hopefully you all have enjoyed this really cool video of a really cool instrument, the Simone Celesta from 1949. There's not a lot to say about it because it's a pretty simple instrument. It's not like one of these digital pianos I've been reviewing that has 35 different sounds and all these different features. So this video feels unnaturally short to me. Um, but I feel like we pretty have we pretty much have gotten a pretty comprehensive review of this Simone Celesta. It is super super neat and it's a very rare find and it really is like a time capsule from 1949. I've never seen an instrument of this age that has been unrestored that is in as good of playing condition as this instrument is. As you can see, it's basically in perfect cosmetic, almost perfect cosmetic function, near perfect mechanical function, and it just works great. It just keeps on ticking and it keeps on going along. Something I often talk about in my digital piano reviews is build quality. You know, how, how well these instruments made. The build quality of this instrument is an 11 out of 10. It stood the test of time, and it's going to con continue to stand the test of time for a very long time to come. Of course, some of that has to do with how the instrument was stored. A lot of instruments of this age often, I wouldn't say fall into the wrong hands, but maybe fall into the hands of someone who doesn't know that an instrument like this is very sensitive to the elements. So you'll see things like this put in a barn or put in an abandoned house or left outside under the weather, and that messes them up pretty severely. But obviously, that's never happened. This instrument. It's been inside all of its life, tucked away, probably under a blanket or in some climate-controlled room in the basement of an orchestra um, hall. So that is super, super cool. I really hope that you all have enjoyed this video. And if you did, you might want to check out my channel. I've got lots of cool videos of acoustic pianos, digital pianos. I've done some videos of those modern celestas made in Germany that I referenced earlier in the video. Go check those out. They're hecka cool. And if you liked any of that stuff, you might want to go check out my channel and think about subscribing. If you do subscribe, thank you very much. If you want to sign up to the Patreon page to get super early sneak peeks of things like this, you also might want to go do that. And if you do all that, thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.